Welcome to my channel, home to history of the macabre, mysterious, and paranormal. This is no ordinary history channel. You've been warned. It might get weird. History of the Dybbuk Box Many people first learned about the Dybbuk Box in 2004 due to an article in the Los Angeles Times. Others may have heard of this haunted object in the 2012 movie The Possession, which was loosely based on the experiences that people have had with this strange box. But what exactly is a Dybbuk box, and why has it caused such negative effects in the lives of its owners? First, let's discuss what a Dybbuk is. The Dybbuk is a malicious spirit in Jewish religious texts that is said to become attached to and possess the living, either as a form of punishment or to carry out unfinished business. Prior to the legend of the Dybbuk box, it wasn't a very well-known creature, and the belief in Dybbuks is not a mainstream Jewish belief. The term Dybbuk was first used in writings from the 16th century, when it was believed that wrongdoing opened a person up to possession by a Dybbuk. It was said that the Dybbuk would cause a person to begin acting out of character, exhibiting signs of severe mental illness, and that the Dybbuk could even speak through a person's mouth. Today, when the notion of a Dybbuk is brought up, most rabbis will recommend seeking psychiatric help rather than exorcism. Dybbuks are also associated with a living human vessel, so the idea of a Dybbuk being attached to an object such as a box doesn't exactly jive with the folklore. If we're going to be accurate here, and if you believe this legend at all, it's a lot more fitting to describe the Dybbuk box as being haunted by a demon. So if it's not actually haunted by a Dybbuk, then why is it called the Dybbuk box? Because that's the way the original owner's granddaughter described it to Kevin Manis when she sold the box to him in 2001. In the modern era, the story of the Dybbuk box begins with Kevin Manis. Kevin Manis was the owner of an arts and antiques store in Portland, Oregon. One day he came across the estate sale of a woman named Havila, who had recently passed away at the age of 103. He purchased a pallet full of items from Havila's granddaughter, among them the Dybbuk box. He sorted through the possessions and saw a wooden wine cabinet that had been padlocked shut. Concerned that it might have been a family heirloom that was sold on accident, he tried to return the box to Havila's granddaughter, but she refused to take it back. She told him that the box belonged to her grandmother, a Holocaust survivor, and that she had been warned to never open what her grandmother referred to as the Dybbuk box. Manis tried repeatedly to give the box back to her, explaining that he didn't want his money back, he just wanted to do the right thing and give the box back to the family. The granddaughter became more and more upset and still refused to take the box back, so eventually Kevin left with his items and returned to his antique store. He left the box in the basement and carried on with his day. Approximately 30 minutes after leaving his shop, he received a phone call from a salesperson who worked at the store. She claimed that she'd heard glass break and feared that someone had broken into the shop, especially because when she tried to leave the store, she found that she'd been locked in. Manus rushed back to his shop and called the police, who weren't able to find any sign of an intruder. However, down in the basement, they found that every single light bulb had shattered. Because there was only one entrance and exit to the basement, an intruder wouldn't have been able to leave without being seen by Manus or the shopkeeper, and every single door and window was still locked. The shopkeeper quit that day and refused to come back to the store or to even speak about the incident. While this was an odd occurrence, Kevin didn't think it was paranormal at the time. He'd soon be plagued by a number of odd occurrences that would ultimately lead back to the box. Curious about the new addition to his store, Manus opened the box to find two pennies from the 1920s, two locks of hair, one dark, one light, bound with string, a stone sculpture engraved with the Hebrew word for life, shalom, a candlestick, a gold wine goblet, and dried rosebuds. The objects didn't seem to serve any sort of purpose or theme, so Manus believed them to be keepsakes that must have held some sort of sentimental value for Havela. After he opened the box, he began to experience strange smells in his shop, which he described as walls of scent that would be overwhelming in some parts of the basement and completely non-existent in others. His family would also experience these scents, some describing it as the scent of jasmine flowers, while others smelled cat urine, despite no cats having ever been present. He also began to experience electronic malfunctions, a heavy feeling, injuries, unexplainable health problems, and nightmares, 
all of which he would later attribute to the box. At this time, however, he still didn't believe the box was anything but an antique wine cabinet. After examining the box in greater detail, he decided it would make a nice gift for his mother. He polished the box and gave it to his mother for her birthday, and moments later, she had a stroke. It could have been a coincidence, but after learning that his mother had felt an unexplained cold breeze just before she had her stroke, Manus now believes that the incident was related to the box. After the stroke, she lost the ability to speak and had to spell out words on a board until she was able to regain her speech. One of the first things she spelled out to Kevin was, hate gift. And so he took the box back, promising to get her whatever she wanted if she would just get well soon. Kevin had no use for the box himself, so he tried giving it away to other family members, each of whom returned it after a few days complaining of strange smells or that the doors of the cabinet wouldn't stay shut. And remember, at this time, he really didn't think the box was anything paranormal, so he wasn't giving this box to his relatives with any sort of malicious intent. He just believed it to be an ordinary antique. He couldn't seem to get rid of this box, but it wasn't until he began discussing a reoccurring dream he'd been having that he started to connect all of these strange events to the box. In the dream, he explained to his family, he would be walking with someone he knew and trusted, only to see them morph into a hag, that would attack him. He would wake with bruises in the spots where she had struck him. His other family members confirmed to him that they had all had the same dream, and only when they'd been in possession of the Dybbuk box. Everyone described the hag the same way, and the dream stopped after they got rid of the box. Manus realized that the long list of misfortunes and odd events that had happened in his life had all begun when he'd purchased the Dybbuk box. Since he'd been unable to give it away, he listed it for sale on eBay in 2003, explaining the odd circumstances around the box in hopes that the box would be purchased by someone who had more experience with the paranormal than he did. The box was purchased by a college student named Josef Yitschki in June 2003. Not much is known about his experiences with the box, only what he told to the next owner, Jason Haxton, when he sold the box to him in February 2004. Yitschki reportedly suffered from health problems bug infestations, broken light bulbs, and odd smells. One of Nitschke's roommates was a student of Haxton's, and when the student mentioned the box to him, Haxton became intrigued. Haxton, the director of the Museum of Osteopathic Medicine at Andrew Taylor Still University in Kirksville, Missouri, wasn't a believer in the box, but he was intrigued enough by the story to purchase the box for $280. For Haxton, the box was a mystery to solve. Despite his lack of belief in the paranormal aspects of the box, Haxton began to experience strange medical problems right after he purchased the box. Haxton developed hives and welts all over his body, and he began coughing up blood. Looking for a reasonable explanation for his symptoms, Haxton tested the box for heavy metals and biohazards, but every single test came back negative. Haxton also sought medical treatment for his symptoms, but the doctors were unable to find any explanation for what he was experiencing. There was no physical cause for Haxton's sudden illness. Was his mind playing tricks on him because he expected the box to make him sick after hearing about the previous owner's experiences? Or was there something paranormal attached to the box? Curious about both the box and his health problems, Jason got in contact with Kevin Manis. Haxton's interest in the box reignited Kevin's curiosity, so he went back to the woman he had purchased the box from and asked if there was anything more that she could tell him about it. He spoke with her for several hours and learned that Havela's cousin was still alive and that she might know more about the box. He was able to contact her and learned that she and Havela had conducted several seances when they lived in Poland prior to World War II. Spiritualism was very popular in the Western world during this time period so it wasn't uncommon at all for people to be involved in seances as a form of recreation. Havala's cousin, Sophie, told Kevin that they had used a pendulum and a spirit board drawn on cloth to communicate with spirits. There was one spirit in particular that interacted with them repeatedly, and after a short time, the spirit asked the women to bring it over into our world. They were apprehensive about doing what the spirit requested, but agreed to it anyway, thinking they would be safe if they trapped the spirit in a box. On November 10th, 1938, Havala and Sophie conducted the seance that brought the entity into our world, but they were unable to trap the spirit. Not long afterward, Havala and her family were sent to a concentration camp where most of her family died, 
and the original box was lost. Eventually, Havala managed to escape to Spain, and together with Sophie, she bound the spirit to the box that we now think of as the Dybbuk box. According to Sophie, there are also two other boxes associated with the same event that the spirit is somehow attached to. One is in the possession of Kevin Manis, and the whereabouts of the third box are not publicly known. Although the box remained with Havala and her family for many years, her granddaughter said that they did not experience any paranormal activity in their home. However, she was afraid of the box because of what her grandmother had told her, and was especially fearful of what might happen if the box was opened. After experiencing a number of unexplainable events, Jason Haxton consulted with both rabbis and scientists who all gave him the same answer. To stop being affected by the box, whether the cause was natural or paranormal, he should place the box in a wooden container lined with gold. He did as he was instructed, then buried the box in a military-grade, shockproof container where it remained for several years. Haxton no longer suffered from health problems after this. This isn't where the story of the Dybbuk box ends. The legend would actually only grow from here, as Hollywood set to work telling the story, or at least a version of it. Hollywood had taken interest in the Dybbuk box after the 2004 article in the Los Angeles Times was published, but the film wasn't made until 2011. Released in August 2012, The Possession starred Jeffrey Dean Morgan and Kira Sedgwick as the parents of a young girl who begins to feel the effects of the box. The activity that the characters experience in the movie was primarily based on Kevin Manis' experiences with the box, though much of the film was also fictional. Jason Haxton offered to let the filmmakers use the actual Dybbuk box when they were filming. However, everyone involved with the film was too terrified to be near the real box. Instead, a replica box was created. Even using the replica, the cast and crew still had strange experiences, such as light bulbs bursting without explanation. A few days after filming wrapped for the movie, the prop warehouse where the replica of the Dybbuk box was being stored burned to the ground. Investigators were unable to find a cause for the fire, and both arson and electrical problems were ruled out. In March 2017, the box found a new home with paranormal investigator and Ghost Adventures host Zach Baggins. It now resides in his haunted museum in Las Vegas, where you can visit it for yourself. People have reported being scratched, having headaches, and even becoming nauseous and throwing up in the presence of the box. Are you brave enough to stand in the same room as the Dybbuk box? And do you think there's still a more reasonable explanation for the events that have been associated with the box? If you enjoyed this video or learned something new, please let me know by giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to my channel. Until next time, keep it weird.